To correctly position that bracket, I need to put the shutter cocking rack in position on there. If the bracket's too far forward, it allows the transfer shaft, the gear on the transfer shaft to move too far forward. And that might mean that it's not in full contact with the whole width of the shutter cocking rack. And in that case, the teeth would fail fairly promptly. Because you'd have half, a, half the gear doing the whole gear's job. If on the other hand the bracket's too far back, the cocking rack will be stiff in action. It won't float smoothly. I've found in practice that a four thousandth of an inch is the correct clearance in there. It gives me a fairly predictable response. It's moving nice and smoothly and no excess, no excess play. I'm just going to put a spot of lacquer on the top of that screw head to stop it from shifting. It would be more useful if I lacquered the little L-shaped bracket in place. But that's a lot harder to achieve down inside the body casting there. So far so good. Now these pieces can go together. So I've got to slide that shroud complete with front standard into position. And that's held in place with four countersunk head screws. Now usually you can identify two of them because they've got the remains of glue on them. And the other two are very frequently somewhat uh, stressed looking because these screws tend to get done up very tight and perhaps more importantly when they're getting undone, when they're being loosened they tend to uh, require a lot of extra force so the heads are often quite a bit scarred up you can pick them from everything else let's get that hole lined up it's better so the long and the short of it is that your four ugliest large countersunk head screws end up in these positions. And the two ugliest of those end up at the base where they'll be covered by the leatherette. Once all four screws are in position they can be tightened up. Now at this stage don't feel tempted to pull the front standard out into the set front position because that little piece here would doubtless fall out and cause you grief. Leave it where it is. At the base of the camera I want to put the little aluminium piece here that is the film cassette sits into and the tripod socket. I'll get them in place and it's useful to get them in place because otherwise every time you put the camera down on the bench you strike the button here and release the back back catch and um, the back's forever flapping open. These are longer screws. Not the longest. The longest ones go in the film advance lever. These are somewhat intermediate. Once all three are in place they can be tightened up. That's good. Now the release and release lever and lock lever so the film advance can go in. So I want to put some molybdenum paste, lubricate those holes, lubricate that front face that the spring runs on, and the two holes that they run through at the top of the body. I'll start with the lock lever. 
the lock lever's job is to lock the film advance when the frame counter reaches number one. And holding that up with, a fin with my finger from below, I'll fit its spring on the top. The spring, there are two springs that look much the same. This is the lighter of the two springs. The heavier spring goes on the release lever. If I can pick up the circlip and push it into place, we'll be doing well. Usually rotate that so that the open face is to the front. Make sure it's clipped in securely. That's good. Make sure that the lever is free to run. That's good. The release lever. That has the little return spring on the base of it that keeps it in contact with the cam on the film advance shaft and I've got to get that spring in position now I take it off before cleaning because otherwise it's prone to being damaged swing that into place make sure it pops up through the hole at the top make sure that that spring is not bent round backwards or anything awful now holding it up with my finger from below just as before put the heavier of the two similar springs on there and fit the screw at the top that is running much too loosely in there I'm going to have to tighten that shaft up so that the screw doesn't isn't as loose in there um, it probably means it's been twisted left or right the shaft is split needs some tension on it so that it binds that screw better all right i'll just squeeze that s slot at the top of the screw closed slightly with a pair of pliers can't afford to overdo it because otherwise I'll never get the spring to the screw to start. Right, we'll see how much success I'll have with that. As before, I'll hold that up with my finger from below. See if we can get that screw started. Yeah, but it's still too loose. If it's loose it won't hold its adjustment and that's my concern so it's going to need a little bit more treatment I think that effectively what has happened is that the screw had been pushed one way or the other and effectively opened that slot up okay As I said, I dare not overdo it or I'll never get the screw to start. It would be helpful if the screw had a uh, 
a taper on the front of it to help it lead in, but it doesn't. It's just a just a normal screw form. There is another cheat that you can use if that screw is loose and doesn't hold its position well, which you can use if the camera is assembled and you're trying to get things to, to stay where they're put, and that's to put a little touch of lacquer on the thread of that screw. But that's still loose. I think I will be using a little touch of lacquer method on that one when I get to do the stage where I'm doing the adjustments. Alright, that's quite good. I'm going to put the rewind and the um, strap lug on the end of the body here now and that's because I want to be able to stretch an elastic band across here to hold the shutter release shaft in position once I get to that point. So I better find the parts. Okay, so the rewind shaft. It's a two-piece arrangement. The inner slides up inside the outer and that allows you to raise the knob to wind the film back into the cassette. Otherwise you would lift the whole thing out of the cassette and wouldn't be able to wind anything. And I'm using some synthetic grease in the bush. Lift that tab to get that started on there. And just check that that revolves smoothly. There should be some resistance. It, um, that's fine, but it should revolve smoothly. That can go in place. And there are just two countersunk head screws that go in there and unlike the ones holding in the shroud and front standard these screws are usually not chewed up because they're usually easier to get out So are undamaged. And both screws are in position, they can be tightened up. And I'll put the strap lug in place. The strap lug's held in place with two screws, quite long, rounded head screws. The strap lug has slotted holes so that you can adjust the position of the strap lug. In practice I find that you, the only position you need to worry about is pushing the strap lug towards the end of the body as far as it will go against the heads of those screws. If you achieve that then 99 times out of 100, that's going to be the ideal spot. So I'll do those screws up tight. That's our strap lug done. Now I can turn my attention to the shutter release. Now the shutter release here is, on later cameras, this is just one piece. Nothing exciting. On this camera, we have a collar here and there's actually a little spacer washer too for adjustment to take up some adjustment. So I'll put that little washer on there first because that's easily lost and then the, the little bush that goes on there and slide this into position from the top. Now there's a return spring that goes on that shaft. It's quite a heavy return spring. I'll get that in position. 
And that's another component that's very easily lost. So this is why we need the elastic band. Just to hook it around that, shut a release shaft so it can't get away. Otherwise it'll fall out and then we'll have trouble. Right, so now the front standard we can open and close it to our heart's content. That's nice and secure. And I can assemble the focus mount mechanism here to the front. So I'll get onto that. Here are the bits and pieces I need. I'll start by putting the focus mount itself in place. When this arrived, of course, that was in the wrong place because it had the retainer was pushed around behind it like some sort of glorified shim. There are four screws hold this in place. We'll get them in place now. As usual, get all of the screws in place. Once they're all in place, you can tighten them up and not before. There's almost always some clearance or uh, slop, if you like, in the way things fit together. If you just put one screw in and tighten it up, you can just about guarantee one of the holes won't line up. Right, they're all in position. I'll just tighten those up. Now the screw heads here are a little bit damaged, so I'm being very careful not to let my screwdriver cam out. That's fine. That's all that's needed there. Now, the focus inner and outer helical. Now these had been marked by someone else. I can probably guess what those marks were for and where they started. I'll get those marks aligned first and then I'll look and see what I think. There's two ways people can mark things like this. Normally what I'm interested in when I've got the inner and outer helical here is to get the alignment correct. I want the front face of the inner and outer helical dead flat. So they're at exactly the same level. And then I can mark across them and then I know that if that mark lines up and the front face is level, that the helical is back where it started. The alternative is people can mark them at the infinity position. Now the infinity position is a bit hard to judge when you've just got this in your hand. All you can say about the infinity position is that the inner helical must be level or slightly forward of the outer helical at the infinity position. Otherwise you couldn't get, get this to pull back as far as the infinity position. Right, let's get these lines marked up, um, marks lined up and then see what it looks like. So it's the multi-start thread, I think it's 16 starts. So with the lines mark, lined up there, those marks lined up, the front inner is quite a bit out from the outer, so I think it's probably one click out. Now there, those components are lined up, the inner and outer helical are absolutely in the same plane. So I think that's the best place to start, that certainly would be where how I would mark that component if I had put those marks there. Of course, this camera had been somewhat buggered about with, um, to say the least. So it's anyone's guess where these components were when I started with the camera. But somebody put those marks on there, it's the sort of thing I would have done, it's the sort of thing other technicians do, and I think that's probably the right place. I don't know which way up this thing would have been, unless they've also put some sort of scribe mark on the focus scale ring, and there isn't one. So I have to guess what another technician's favoured policy would be. So I'll see if this thing will sit on the 
the guide posts it will and I'll check to see if it moves smoothly that's pretty good I've seen smoother I'll try it any other way it won't even go on at all around this way then that's a good sign that it was the other way that's very tight I don't think it was that way I think it was this way yeah I think that's it so Based on that, at this point, I can always come back and change my mind. Um, we will con I'll continue with that. So what I'm going to do here is just, this is all being cleaned. I'm just running a bit of solvent on there, a bit of naphtha, and I'm going to work these two components together. They're both brass, and if there are any little high spots, they'll just polish each other down, as long as there's a bit of lubricant there. And that feels nice and smooth now. That's good. That can be... I've put some helical grease on there. And that can be put in place, I think. This is what I'm using. Helimax XP Optical and Instrument Helical Grease. It's a white, very soft grease. So I've put some of this on in about five or six places around the in a helical and you don't need to clog the threads up work that in see how that feels that's nice and smooth I'll run some around the outside where this runs in the mount now you wouldn't need to particularly use this grease for this purpose. Just about anything would do. But this is here, so I'm using it. And where the, this runs on the guide posts, I'll just put a smear in there too. Here. And I've decided that it was probably around that way. Now the plate that holds that down, the retainer, that had been assembled around the back of the focus mount for some interesting reason I'll just put a little bit on there and drop that into place and get the screws in here now there's four countersunk head screws that hold the retainer plate in place Once they're all in place they can be tightened up. I'll check the action of the helical again. It's nice and smooth. That's good. I'll collapse the front of the camera and I want to put the four long screws here, the black ones through, that screw through to the bellows and hold the bellows to the back of the front standard. get all four started and then do them up now because you are crushing up the felt 
light trap and the leather of the bellows that's not like pulling up hard against a piece of metal so you have to sort of judge where that should be. So the bellows are now firmly attached to the back of the front standard and I can put my focus scale ring in place. Now I know roughly that infinity is going to be somewhere around here and there are probably marks on the focus scale ring. I can see one there where the screw heads bit. So I'm going to put my focus scale ring there. I may need to come back and adjust this because we haven't got any alignment marks of course. But I think that that's a the screw heads often leave a mark on the focus scale ring and you can use that to help you judge where it should have been. I'm looking closely at the other positions and I don't see any mark at all so I've only got one faint mark. Normally I'd expect to get three or four and of course the faint mark is very faint and may mean nothing at all. I'm not fooling myself. But I know that the infinity would be somewhere in this area. I just don't know exactly where it is. So we may be spending some time getting the infinity adjustment correct once I've got the shutter and lens assembly fitted back in the body. Yeah, that looks it looks appropriate. Here's their coupling arm that couples to the range binder. It's always a wriggle to get this thing in it. It's, um, a lousy design. How somebody designed that on paper with the expectation it would work is beyond me. Here's the end of the arm. Here it is. I can just see the end of the arm here. So I'll get its little post screw in there while the going is good. Of course there's two small screws hold this to the inner helical. One of them just flew away. Let's get this one in position and hunt up the first one. Hope it hasn't hidden itself somewhere inaccessible. There it is. God for that. At this stage you don't want screws falling down into the space between the shroud and the bellows otherwise Inevitably they would find themselves a little patch of grease to stick to so you wouldn't be able to shake them loose and you'd have to dismantle the camera to get the things back out. Here we go. So that part's done. Now shutter release is in. Now they've got the gear that drives the cocks the shutter at the front here. That's got to go on. 